Welcome to season three of the Casual Friday podcast. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson. If you're new to my channel, I do two videos each week. I do Technique Tuesdays and Casual Friday. Casual Friday, which you're watching right now, is a video podcast about my knitting life in the past week where the Technique Tuesday videos are a very specific focused video on a specific knitting topic. As always, if you'd like to jump right to any specific point in the video, there are direct timestamp links down in the description. So I skipped last week's Casual Friday because we were on the road traveling over the holidays. So I have uh, quite a few things to update you on. Uh, first off, I want to just reintroduce myself. Some of you may not be uh, familiar with, with who I am and, and, and what this podcast is about. Uh, then I'm going to tell you about some objects that I finished over the holidays. And then a new project that I am just in the planning stages for that I spontaneously decided um, when I was on my uh, my holiday road trip. Then I wanted to uh, show you a book, a really cool knitting book that I checked out of the Textile Center Library a couple of weeks ago and I've been diving into and I'm having a lot of fun with. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up with a couple of knitting tidbits. So let's get started. Three years ago, in early February, I began posting a weekly technique video every Tuesday. And then after I'd been doing that for a year, in January 2018, I decided to add a second a weekly video that I call Casual Fridays. And that's what this is. And this is really more of a, a video podcast. I often do include information about techniques and talk about my knitting process and how I solve knitting problems in projects that I'm currently working on or that I'm designing. Um, but the Tuesday videos are very, very focused on a very specific technique and they go uh, quite in depth on those techniques. So these are two different uh, types and styles of knitting videos. This one is much more conversational and they tend to be longer. So I am a certified master hand knitter through the Knitting Guild Association as well as a certified knitting teacher through the Craft Yarn Council. If you're wondering what those two things are, I'll put some links again down in the description. But I also did a very early Casual Friday video on this topic, which uh, you will see linked to here. Um, scrolling across the top of your screen. You can look at it anytime in the video. You can pause and click in that upper right hand corner and you'll see a list of any video I'm talking about um, within this particular Casual Friday episode. So currently I have almost 300 videos on the channel. A uh, hundred of them are Casual Fridays from the past couple of years. Those are all contained in a playlist um, that's called Casual Fridays that you can find on my channel. Uh, every other video is a technique video and every video is put into at least one playlist. Sometimes they're in multiple playlists. I have a lot of videos on socks sock heels, sock basics, and sock toes um, that you might find interesting, but just a wide range of techniques from the most basic to some really kind of esoteric uh, techniques as well. So you can uh, look through the playlists, you can look through um, the entire list of videos, you can search on the channel to see if, if I've done something, uh, a technique video on something that, that you're interested in learning about. Um, but I will continue posting new technique videos uh, every Tuesday for the foreseeable future. So every year I kind of look back on the previous year to see what I've done that maybe I wanted to do and I can kind of say, oh yeah, I, I kept on track with that. Or I look back on the things that kind of surprised me that I didn't expect and I, and I just reflect back on what I've done in the previous year and what out of all of those things do I wanna keep doing and are there things that I wanna do differently or are there things that I had wanted to do the previous year that I just didn't manage to do. So a couple of years ago, I had a goal of knitting with a variety of wool breeds because I tended to knit with just a couple of different ones. So I really started to seek out yarns made from other uh, breeds of wool than what I was used to. And I was kind of having a trouble with that. 
And so I went to our local wool festival thinking that would be the place to get these yarns. And what I realized was that really what I could get at the festival was raw wool from different breeds. And once I really saw all the, these different wool breeds up close, that was when I realized how important it was for me to experience the wool from raw form all the way through to the knitting form. I know now that there are sources, particularly mail order sources, where you can buy yarns from different wool breeds. But the problem I have with the commercially available yarns that are made from different wool breeds is that essentially they look very similar. You can't see the differences in the staple length and you can't see the difference in the crimp when they're already spun. And they tend to be spun in a very narrow range of ways. With hand spinning, you have a, a wider range of how to treat each of those types of wool. So I understand that now and it's something that, that I'm wanting to do more of. But it, particularly in that first year, I really struggled to spin consistently, meaning like to, to spend time consistently. And there were, there were a number of obstacles that, that I blamed on this. One was not having a chair that was the right height because I really was uncomfortable in a standard height chair. So I ordered a, a stool made by a woodworker who lives in the next state. And it instead of taking two months, it took five months. Then I went to a spinning conference and I, and I ordered a drum carter, which also took about five months to get. And so there were all these, these delays that kept me from spinning. But ultimately, it's just not having the habit. The latest thing that I felt was an obstacle was that in order to spin more, I would have to do less of something else. I would have to spend less time doing something else. And I wasn't going to spend less time knitting. And so I was trying to figure out, well, how am I going to do that? And I, because I also want to do some more design work and publish some more patterns. And how was I going to manage all of that? So a couple of weeks ago, I saw a video um, that Veritasium, there's a channel called Veritasium. He does a lot of science and physics related videos, but he did a video on why most New Year's resolutions fail. And I thought, okay, well, I have a couple of, of goals in mind. One was to spin more and that I've been consistently failing at. So I thought I'd take a look at the video. And so he had, I think it was five reasons why they fail, but the one that really stuck out for me was that the goal needs to be very specific. You don't just say, I want to lose weight or I want to exercise more or I want to, you know, something like that. It needs to be a very specific uh, goal to have. And so rather than saying, I want to spin more, in 2020, I decided instead that I'd go back to when I was first learning to spin and it was really hard. And I forced myself to spin 15 minutes every time that I sat down to spin. And I did, wasn't spinning every day. I was, because I was building muscle memory from scratch. So I would spin and then I'd wait a few days and then I would do it again. But I was doing it for 15 minutes. I'd set a timer because it was so, frustrating because I was so bad at it. And then I would keep the results of each spinning session separate so that I could see visually what my improvement was. And about the fourth or fifth spinning session, things started clicking with me and then it felt good and it was fun. And I, I spent about a half hour, 45 minutes spinning because it was fun. So I knew that I needed that sort of uh, force myself to do this for a certain amount of time until it was comfortable enough and natural enough that I could do it. My goal this year is to spend 15 minutes every day spinning. I assume that one of two things is going to happen. Either I will just spin 15 uh, minutes per day and gradually get better at it, or I will spin 15 minutes every day, get better at it, like it more, and find myself spinning more, spending more time um, each session spinning um, than I ever have, and I will enjoy it more, and it will just carry me forward. So that's, uh, I don't know what the end result is going to be, but I have this very specific, small, concrete goal that I really feel that I can meet. And one of the things that I am using to 
keep me on track is a don't break the chain calendar. This particular one is produced by a graphic designer who's on, uh, who's a YouTuber. She creates these every year and it's a way you, it just puts a whole year on one page and you can mark off, um, when you work each, each goal. And so the, the idea is to don't break the chain that you want to have an unbroken chain of X's. Um, but you can forgive yourself if you skip a few, but that's the goal is that it, it just builds up a habit and it's a, the reward is seeing that you have actually uh, done what you set out to do. So that is, um, my goal for new year's. So over the holidays, we drove a couple of my, my last casual Friday video, I, I ended with the road trip that we took uh, in our Tesla down to Santa Fe. It's about 1200 miles, which is 1900 kilometers. We did it in, a in two days. We drove down there. And so I took knitting with me and I was knitting a pair of socks for my daughter. I finished the first sock. Um, on the trip down. I finished the second one while we were there. And then I started another pair for my daughter's boyfriend. So she's living in Amsterdam. So she has an English boyfriend and both of them came to the United States for the holidays and she has uh, deemed him sock worthy. So I measured his feet and um, knit him a pair of socks. And so his, it, they're both knit with the same with Cascade Heritage 150 prints. They're different colorways. So for both of them, I use what's called a plain heel that I talked about a few weeks ago in the Sock Knitters Workshop. This is a, a, a German book that was translated into English. The plain heel is basically a peasant or afterthought heel, only it's done right when you finish the leg rather than placing waist yarn, uh, working the rest of the foot and then coming back to it. You work the heel and then you work the foot. So you can, you can work the whole heel um, in the same order that you would work any other um, sock. What's interesting about the plain heel, they have both the peasant heel and the plain heel in that book. And the plain heel, they refer to it as a heel that's good if you have a little bit higher instep than uh, what a, a peasant heel would fit. So with the plain heel, you, you knit down, you knit the leg, um, and then you place the instep stitches on waist yarn and you do a provisional cast on right here. So you're knitting in the round this heel from this point toward the base of the heel. And then you, when you, the heel's done, you've grafted it shut. You come back uh, to the instep and then you um, take the provisional cast on out and then you've got only stitches uh, for the foot and you knit the foot after that. So one of the things that they uh, tell you about in this book with using the plain heel is that when you do your provisional cast on, you can cast on additional stitches. You don't, so if you have say a, a sock that's 64 stitches in circumference and you would have had 32 stitches for your instep, when you are doing the provisional uh, cast on, you don't have to cast on 32 stitches. You can cast on more than that. And by casting on more stitches, that makes the heel larger and allow, provides for more room. So because my daughter has skinny ankles and a high instep, I did do an increase um, when I did the provisional cast on for her to create a roomier heel. And that works for me as well. So her boyfriend, Sam, has a nine inch ankle, which would mean normally that I would knit a sock that was eight and a half inches in circumference. But he has a 10 inch ball of foot, which would typically mean he needs a, a sock foot that needs to be nine, nine inches in circumference. So what I did was I kind of split the difference because this is the first pair of socks I'm knitting for him. And you can knit a sock to fit somebody, but it still may not fit the way that they want. So, and then you tweak from there. So what I did, he has got that nine inch ankle. I knit a sock leg that was eight and a half inches in circumference and the foot is eight and a half inches in circumference. So that makes the foot a little bit snugger, but I personally like a snugger 
sock foot than sock leg. So we'll see how it works out for him. But he doesn't have a particularly high instep. And because I knit the sock leg a little bigger in the, in, uh, the round that I normally would have um, for a nine inch ankle, he had plenty, uh, I had plenty of stitches to create just a regular um, heel for him. So I didn't need to add any stitches for the plain heel like I did for my daughter. Now I did a different toe for each one of them. For my daughter, I did a round toe. And for Sam, I did a standard uh, wedge toe. Before I knit uh, socks for someone the first time, I traced their foot and I looked to see when their toes start to, when their foot starts to narrow after the ball of their foot. Some people uh, have really different um, toe lengths and they need a shorter toe or they need a longer toe. So his, the way his toes are shaped, he needed a fairly long uh, graduated wedge toe. So I uh, modified the wedge toe. The standard wedge toe has you alternating a plain round with a decrease round until you're down to about a third of the stitches that you started with. Um, but he needed something that was more gradually tapered. So I alternated with two plain rounds for quite a bit of the toe. And then I switched to just a single plain round after each decrease round. And I, I've done videos on this on how to modify that. I'll, I'll put that uh, link up there. Uh, the round toe that I did for my daughter, uh, I was able to use basically the standard uh, formula for round toe, but you can alter that as well based on the length of, of toes needed. She tried this on, it was the first time I'd done a round toe for her. I had tried it out for myself uh, last summer. And at first I thought, I don't like this. It fits a little bit, it feels a little too snug. But over time, I realized it really did conform to my toes in a way that I liked better. So when she tried this on, I said, let me, you know, tell me what you think about that toe. I haven't done that, that style of toe for you before. She goes, oh, oh, I like the way this fits better than the other uh, sock toes. So from now on, I'll be using a round toe for her. Whenever I'm going on a trip, I, if I haven't been there before, I'll, I'll look up and see what yarn shops are in the area. And typically I'll try to see if I can get there during the time I'm in town and go take a look at the yarn shop and I'll look for anything that's unusual. Typically I just get a ball of sock yarn because that's all I can carry if I've traveled there by plane. A couple of years ago when we were in Santa Fe over Thanksgiving, I went to the local yarn shop there and bought a few things. And so I really hadn't planned on going to a yarn shop while I was in Santa Fe. But we were driving along a road. It's a pretty main road there. It's kind of uh, in a ring around the, the old part of Santa Fe called Paseo de Peralta. And we were driving along there on our way uh, to lunch. And I saw a sign. It was this big vertical sign uh, that said yarn, etc. That just, it was like a magnetic <laughs> force. I'm like, look at that. And, you know, we went around the corner and I was like, what is that? What is that? And I was on my phone looking to see what, what that was because I couldn't quite tell. I just had seen the sign, but I couldn't really tell uh, what the shop was. So it turns out it's a shop called Miriam's Well, and the shop owner is named Miriam. But um, so after lunch, we were with my mother-in-law and my husband drove my mother-in-law home and I just walked over to the yarn shop and to see what it was. And I walked through there and I saw a number of yarns that I had never seen before. And so I was trying to, trying to decide, because I'm not usually a stasher. I've talked about this a number of times. I, I usually need to know what project I'm going to knit and then I choose a yarn. I will sometimes stash uh, a sweater quantity of a solid worsted weight wool because I know that I can knit a sweater with cables with that, or I just know about how much yarn I need for something like that. So I occasionally will do that. And sock yarn, I know I can knit a pair of socks uh, with some self-striping sock yarn, so that's no problem. But, but typically I want to know what I'm going to knit and then I figure out what yarn I'm going to need for that. So if I buy yarn, I have a much harder time trying to figure out what to do with it. So I was going through this shop and I realized I didn't have to 
confine myself to a ball of sock yarn. And I don't even know if she had sock yarn in that shop. I don't remember. Um, but I did see a number of other yarns that were kind of really interesting. And she is primarily a weaver. She's a designer and a, she's a weaver. And I could tell she had a European accent. I was not going to say, where are you from? Um, because she's from Santa Fe now. But um, I could tell she was from somewhere else. And the yarns were really interesting. And so I started thinking about well, what, what would I want to get what, and then what would I use it for? Like what kinds of projects do I have coming up in my mind? And so what yarn would I need for that? And one of the things that I had thought of at first was, well, I skipped the 1920s. So a year ago, I really started diving into vintage and antique uh, sweater patterns. And I decided I was going to knit myself through the 20th century decade by decade. So I knit a sweater designed in 1904 from the Edwardian era. I knit uh, a sweater um, designed in World War I that I, that I made. I skipped temporarily the 1920s and moved on and did a sweater from 1938. So one of the reasons that I skipped the 1920s was because I couldn't decide if I wanted to do a man's sweater or if I wanted to do a women's sweater. Now, and the man's sweater that I was considering was very similar to the women's sweater from 1918 that I had just knit. And I, I kind of want to do something a little different. So, and the problem with the women's sweaters from the 1920s is that the fashions were very long, you know, kind of past the hips and very narrow. So that boyish figure was in style. And a lot of the, and in most cases, vintage sweaters are designed in one size. And it hasn't been too much of a problem for me so far. I've either been able to knit the size that the sweater is written in or or adjust it a little bit to have it fit me. But some of the sweater patterns I've seen for women, I'm like, oh, I love that. And then it's like 28 inches in circumference. And I'm like, okay, that is not going to fit me. And then that particular very straight style for the boyish figure is not the figure that I have. So I really had to think about uh, what it is I wanted to, to knit from the 1920s. So when I'm going through this shop, I thought, oh, well, I could buy yarn for the men's 1920s sweater. Uh, and I was trying to think about how much yarn I needed for that because it has a really thick doubled over shawl collar um, and it's a pretty long sweater and it has pockets. And I was, you know, thinking about all of the elements and you can't, you can't base it on whatever the sweater says you need because they're calling for a yarn that doesn't exist anymore. They're not telling you the yardage you need. And again, they're only telling you from one size. And so there's a lot of, you know, calculating and it's not like I would have another opportunity to go back to the shop and get more <laughs> if, I, if I didn't get enough. So I was thinking about how much am I gonna need? How much am I gonna need? So I, I got as much as I thought and then I went and I got another one. And it was a yarn that, um, it's a blue, it's a blue heathery yarn. It's probably hard to see on, on camera. Um, the company is Marisol and this particular yarn is called Huni. Um, and it's fine Peruvian Highland wool, which Peruvian Highland wool is something I've knit with many, many times. Uh, what's nice about this particular yarn is that um, a portion of the money goes to the schools uh, for um, children who live in the area where where the the sheep um, where the wool comes from. So that appealed to me, and so I got I don't know how many skeins of this I got eight or nine skeins of, of this, thinking I'm going to make that 1920s uh, sweater uh, with this yarn. So I got it to the cash register, and this woman. Says to, um, says to me, oh, well, uh, help yourself to a Danish Christmas cookie. So I said, oh, are you from Denmark? Because I recognized that she had this, this accent, but I didn't know where she was you know, originally from. And she says, she said, yes, I am. And I said, oh, I just recently bought a book on traditional Danish sweaters, which I, ta I talked about this book a few weeks ago. And by Vivian Hawksbro, I said, are you familiar with that book? Because the, this book was originally written in, in Danish and then it was translated to English. 
And uh, I said, you know, are you familiar with this book? And she said, oh, yes. I'm very good friends with Vivian and her husband. I've done workshops with them. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So then I thought, you know, that would be the perfect sweater to knit is one of these traditional Danish sweaters. I just love them because they're in texture and they, uh, and I was just captivated by the stitch patterns in here they have a, like a stitch dictionary of these eight pointed stars like you'd see in Norwegian sweaters except they're in texture they're not in color work and I love texture and so I thought well that is what I'm going to do with this particular yarn is I'm going to make one of these traditional uh, design my own traditional Danish sweater unless I see one that's in here there are a number of patterns in here I might decide I'll just uh, use one of the patterns that's already in here um, but I'll design myself a Danish sweater of using the yarn I bought from the woman in Santa Fe who is Danish and who is friends with the author. So that helped me out. And then for sure, I know I will have enough yarn because um, it, none of these are going to have a, a shawl collar. None of these are going to have something that eats up yarn the way a shawl collar would or that cables would. I have a lot of knitting books. You can see a number of them here and I have a whole bunch that you can't see that are off camera and I did a series on a tour, my tour of my of my knitting library this past fall. I think it took six weeks to go through each each section of the library. Um, so I love acquiring new knitting books but I don't always know if I'm actually going to want a knitting book. Um, more and more yarn shops are are declining to carry books in their shops anymore um, because the first of all they can't compete with online uh, sellers so uh, so often you hear about a book and you can't just go down to your yarn shop and take a look at it and and decide if you want to buy it or not and so i don't always want to just go online and buy one but we have a textile center here in the twin cities that has uh, the libraries of all the various guilds so the Knitters Guild, the Weavers Guild, they've got, there's like um, embroidery guilds and quilting guilds and all of that kind of stuff. So the guilds all keep their books that they buy with their funds in the Textile Center Library. It's a physical location. So it's the largest textile library in the country. And regardless of which guild you belong to, you can check out any of the books from the Textile Center Library. So often when I find out about a book, I will check it out first. And so sometimes I end up buying it and then sometimes I think, well, that was really interesting, but it's not something that I'm going to want to keep in my own library. But some of the things that I bought, like that Danish, traditional Danish sweaters, that was one I checked out from the library and went, oh, I have to have this and I bought it. Um, Another one was this uh, book here I have on Estonian knitting. It's a, it was kind of an expensive book and I, it was on, it, it's a second of I think three volumes and this one was on stockings and socks. And it, because it was so expensive, I didn't think I was gonna buy it and I, I checked it out and I was like, this is amazing and, and I did buy it. Um, so this is another book that is really interesting that I checked out from the Textile Center Library. It's called Magic Motifs, a Knitting with a Secret Message. And it's by Carla, she's Dutch. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I'll put it on the screen. Meisen, Meisen? When I started reading the book, I realized I knew her sort of virtually. She is a master hand knitter. And she, at part of the time that I was working on the master hand knitting program, she was as well. And so she would take uh, chunks of time. Like I took four years off in the middle of, of the seven years it took me to do the master hand knitting program. And I think she, she stopped um, more often. Um, and so it took her even, even longer to complete the program, but she did complete it a couple of years ago. And one of the things that stopped her periodically was that she was teaching a lot of workshops and she was, tra and she was um, writing other uh, knitting books. So this, this knitting book is, she, she did a trip to Latvia. Well, she was going to all the Baltic states looking at their various knitting traditions. And while she was in Latvia, 
they were showing her examples of mittens or something like that. And then someone said, oh, we'll, we'll uh, show you how to create a knitting pattern based on your birth date. And this is something that was often done is, is that you sort of knit people's birthdays in the knitting, but it's not in a way that you would recognize it as their birthday. And so they use what's called magic squares. It's slightly different than if you've ever done magic squares in a math class where you have a grid of say three or four boxes across and down and all of the number, you have to use every number once and they all have to add up to the same number where you, whether you're going horizontally on any given row or vertically or diagonally. Um, that is typically what's thought as the magic square. This one is a little different. It's kind of based on a multiplication table. And when you get a two digit number, you just preserve the final digits. So there, the numbers that are in this grid are zero through nine. And they're in various uh, sequences depending on what combination of row or column it is. So you take somebody's birthday like the two digits for the day, the two digits for the month, and the four digits for the year. So then you go through through the grid, and let's say the, the first box has a one in it. If there is a one anywhere in your birthday, then you would color that in. And then you go to the next square, and the next square, and the next square. And so it's, it's a um, numeric pattern that is very specific and symmetrical. And so you end up with a very symmetrical um, color work um, grid. And then what you do is you take that square and you flip it vertically so you get a mirror Im image of it. And then you take that and you flip it horizontally so then you get a, you know, a mirror image of, of what you have on top then you flip it down. And so you have this kind of even larger grid that creates your stranded color work pattern and then you can just tile that you just repeat that over and over again however many times you want and it can create these really interesting designs sometimes they don't work out great just depending on the, what numbers you have in your birthday it might be might fill too many things up or not fill things up enough if you have a lot of if you have too many unique numbers in the in all of those out of the eight uh, digits in in your birthday or if you have too many repeats uh, of, of numbers in your birthday, it might not uh, work out very well. But then there's another type of square called a Vedic square um, that's done slightly differently and can produce a, a, a variation of those patterns. But it's a really interesting way of generating a stranded color work pattern that has meaning. And so you can knit that into a baby gift or into a wedding gift or, or just somebody's birthday present or, or something like that. And it's a way of really personalizing it where nobody else would necessarily know, but it creates a really great stranded color work pattern. Well, she was intrigued by, by this whole concept and she, uh, and, the, and they were only done based on numbers and birthdays. So she figured out a way to extend that to the alphabet and create a number associated with each, a, a single digit number associated with each letter of the alphabet. And so that you could do somebody's name or you could do a word or a phrase or, or something like that. And then again, create the stranded color work pattern um, that you could use in a design. And then she, she extended even further using ASCII code and using braille. So she extended this idea of all of the different ways that you could encode a secret message into your stranded color work or even into your texture work in the case of the braille. So I was having a lot of fun with it. So um, so I was playing with uh, my birthday using um, the magic squares and the Vedic square and then I played with my name Roxanne and then I played with just and I thought huh, I'm not sure I, I totally like that one. What if I just did rocks and it created something very similar but slightly different. Um, so it's really fun and it's, uh, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. So, um, so that is, um, the book that I am currently playing with and intrigued by. So the last thing that I want to tell you about is a TV series that we just got on Netflix here in the U S in December and it's a British show called the repair shop. 
And because when I'm knitting, I'm always liking to, to stream something. And I really like TV shows because then there's a bunch of them. And especially if they have a lot of seasons, then I can just let it keep going while I'm knitting. So the premise of this TV show is that people are bringing in their family heirlooms. Now, these are not heirlooms that necessarily have a lot of monetary value. They're typically th something that, that connects the person to their family history. It might have been something that their grandmother owned or it had been passed down for generations and it's in a state of disrepair. And so it could be a clock, it could be a teddy bear or a doll, it could be a toy a train or a fire truck or it could be a desk or you know, it could be anything. And it could be something that a family member actually made themselves or it could just be something that's been in the family for generations. And when the people bring it in, they usually have, you know, they always ask them, what do you want us to do to it? Because sometimes the history of this object is so important to the object, like seeing that history in it, that they do conservation on the item rather than restoration. So restoration is like bringing it back to brand new. Um, versus conservation, which is making it um, usable again, but keeping the scars and the marks um, that are part of that item's history. And so you'll get, there have been a number of people who brought in things um, like from when they were a child and they were evacuated from London in the war and right before Christmas, and this was the, the doll that they got at Christmas, and they lived in that home, you know, for a number of years until the war was over, and and um, so, like, the people who restore the toys are very careful, especially with the teddy bears. They never get rid of any part of the actual, like, teddy bear or doll. Like, there's a woman who brought in, a do the doll's legs were basically in shreds, and she'd put um, stockings um, over them to, to keep the legs together and so they removed the legs and they made a little pouch for them and folded up the original legs put them in the pouch and when they made the new body and legs for this doll they put the pouch inside the, ta the doll's uh, tummy so that all of the original parts would remain with the doll. So it, it's, there's so many times that I just want to cry at the end of it because it's like so, it's so moving and you just see when people see the restoration or the conservation of this item you can see from their face this this flood of memory and emotion coming over them and I get choked up just thinking about it but it's something that I just love watching while I'm knitting because I feel like I'm creating by hand something that's special. At the same time, these people are using every one of their their skills in the in the craft of their choice um, to preserve something that is super super important important to a, to an individual person. Um, so that's that's the thing that um, with, they've only got two seasons of it on the U.S. on uh, Netflix. I don't know. Um, in other countries how many seasons they might have there. I think that there are four or five seasons all together. So I've been looking online to see if I could uh, find another source for the additional seasons because I've already watched both uh, both of the two seasons that are on Netflix. But I thought I'd pass that on to you because I just think it's uh, it's the kind of show that I think people who are knitters would, would really enjoy. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.